And now your host of Where's My Parachute, it's Steve Lemure. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey. Dr. Adams is like, oh, God, what did I get myself into <laughs> in the <laughs> intro like that? That was our, our very first guest provided that intro uh, suggesting that he fell out of an airplane without a, his parachute opening, so... That's where that came from. We might want to think about redoing that one uh, one day. Oh, come on. <laughs> it, it, it's a legacy deal now. For That's him. true. It's yeah. probably the only thing he has. <laughs> you're not wrong on that. I don't, I don't think you're wrong on that at all. <laughs> all right. We got Aaliyah with us again today. Hey. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you. We have special guest Scott Cronister live with his Dallas Cowboy hat on because he's from Chicago, and he's such a huge Cowboys fan. I'm super psyched <laughs> about that. And Dr. Ken Adams, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Man, I'm glad you're here. Um, we will have uh, a lot to cover and not very much time, but um, let's just start off with, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey and where you're at now, and we can, I know we've got a, a bunch of topics that we can go into, but why don't we go why don't we start there? All right. Well, since we're talking about legacy, uh, there are seven generations of Presbyterian ministers in my family, and I joke that I'm probably the only person who uh, ever became a doctor and disappointed his dad. I was the last <laughs> of five boys, and none of them became ministers, and neither did I. Um, grew up, I uh, was born in, uh, in Japan and uh, spent the first eight years of my life in New Mexico and moved to Texas in 1980, and I've been here ever since. Sooner or later, I'll have to say I'm a Texan, um, but have uh, lived in Dallas for the majority of that and uh, am a physician by training, but haven't really practiced uh, active medicine since about 2005 or so. I've been in corporate uh, leadership roles uh, since then. Some startups have, have been in everything from uh, I'm the one, the only employee where I'm emptying the trash can and running the company. Uh, to working in large 23,000 employee companies, publicly traded as uh, their chief medical officer. Right on, and and so right now, and uh, you're you're affiliated with UT Southwestern. I'm technically a clinical associate uh, faculty there. Okay, um, but that's just a title. Okay, all right. And so what's what's your uh, other than maybe what you're doing with your daughters that we'll get into? What's your uh, what's your day today look like? right now at the moment uh, i'm doing a lot of hanging out at starbucks nice uh we were in the midst of a fundraise for a company uh that we kind of pulled the plug on may 31st we uh, couldn't make all our filings for uh insurance for illinois uh so we're just uh i, I turned some of the potential future uh customers into consulting clients and and at the moment i'm just being a consultant yeah so Truly, you've got the entrepreneurial blood oh, running, absolutely. pulsing. Absolutely, yeah. Ever since I was a little kid. Yeah, uh, cool. Um, what is? Uh, give us some of your highlights on on some of the companies you've been involved in, and and maybe some of the. You just gave us a a, a lower uh, uh, view of one that you pulled the plug on. Although sometimes that's the that's the best day of of a company's life is when you. It's kind of like a boat, right? It's your two happiest days are when you buy the right. boat and when you sell the boat. It's like when you start it and then when you decide, okay, n this isn't going to happen, so we got to shut it up and figure it out. Yeah, it's important, I think, to, to know when to say you're, you're done instead of dragging things out. And this one, this one actually, um, I don't, it still has a lot of legs to it, and we're still going down that okay. road. Um, what was interesting, we're, we're trying to put together uh, a population health management company. We're, we're taking care of a, a population of about 10,000 patients up in the Chicago area. <clears throat> and I think where the investors were kind of balking is none of us within the organization had specifically done this. Uh, a number of us had been parts of different organizations that uh, took care of patients and did population health management. And interestingly, uh, right after we pulled the plug, I got hired uh, as a consultant, uh, chief medical officer for an insurance plan. Oh, wow. uh, so now we do have an individual, me, who has specifically done what we're going to be doing in the future. Right. Um, so it's it's all working out the way it's supposed to work out. I'm, yeah. Cool. I don't stress about it too much. Yeah, good. That It's funny. I So I hit that roadblock a lot uh, in my career because I'll be raising money for something. I don't know, maybe a restaurant or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, the question is, 
you know, how many times have you done this? I'm like, you know what's awesome? I haven't done it, which <laughs> means I have totally fresh eyes. That, you know, right. spin, spin, spin. Absolutely. But, uh, um, but yeah, that's that's a tough one. But the truth is that spin sometimes is exactly what it needs. It needs a fresh set of eyes that hasn't done it so that we don't have the blind spots that the guys that are doing it and unsuccessful at it are doing, right? Agreed. Yeah, so cool. Um, and then uh, uh, and then some of the more memorable ones that, that maybe you've been involved in that, that were exciting. Well, I'm thinking back uh, when I was 14, I got my first job at McDonald's and uh, worked there a total of maybe a week and a half before the general manager out in Irving who owned three or four of them approached me and said, hey, you know, I'd love you to be the manager here at McDonald's. And, <laughs> and uh, can I send you off to Hamburger University? That's a real thing. <laughs> and uh, I had to tell him I was only 14. And <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was that was a great eye opener to why do you stay in school? And right. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to do this the rest of your life. Yeah. That, that's kind of uh, I had a similar situation right out of college where I started a, a job in sales. And, you know, within nine months, I was the number three salesperson in the company. And everybody was like f mid 40s to mid 60s. And I thought. Uh, I think there's probably something else for me. You're right. <laughs> if you're asking me to be the manager at 14 after a few weeks. <laughs> what was great, though, actually, is, that, you know, as I'm running the window and looking out the window and watching the guy mowing the lawn out there, I asked the general manager shortly after that, that first conversation, I was like, who does your lawn? And he told me who and, and told me how much he spends. And I was like, I'll do it for half that. And, and <laughs> right after that, started doing commercial lawn mowing and hiring all my friends at five bucks an hour, which back in, you know, 1980 was huge yeah. money for these kids. And I'm sitting back and enjoying my life, making money off of other people. It was just, it was good times back then. So that's the bug. Yeah, that so, is. So how did you go from that to pre-med and med school? I mean, that seems like a exact opposite track almost. Well, so I, I think I might have mentioned I was born in Japan. So I have an Asian mother. So mm -hmm. uh, if anyone else out there has an Asian mother, you know that she's probably determined what you're going to be. And <laughs> I was told I was going to be a doctor. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think that I can't think of another degree that offers kind of the, the end outcome that, that I've experienced. You know, I have two letters behind my name that tell three things about me that might not actually be true, that I'm hardworking, that I'm smart, and that I'm generally altruistic. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of two other letters that you can have behind your name that convey that to you. So I, I've told my daughters, I was like, I don't care what you become. If you want to be a school teacher, if you want to drive a dump truck, just get your MD first. And then go and do whatever you want with your life. <laughs> just take that little step. Because it, it just opens so many doors. And it's just, it provides a, a different, you know, playing field for, for who, whatever you want to do. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I, I do have to cover this real quickly because I didn't know you grew up in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Where'd you grow up? So I lived for the first couple of years of my life in a little town called Placitas, about 20 miles outside of Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. We literally had a dirt floor house. We had uh, an outhouse out back, and my mom's stove, or not her stove, her oven was an outdoor wood-burning oven. Wow. Four-room house. So wealthy. Oh, yeah. Upbringing. Oh, yeah. We had a yacht. <laughs> we had <laughs> not. <laughs> Wow, and then where else did you go around New Mexico? Pretty uh, much stay in the Albuquerque area? Yeah, I stayed, uh, my mom uh, grew up actually very wealthy in Japan and was pretty insistent that she have uh, running water within the house and, right. and a toilet, so we eventually moved to Albuquerque. There you go. Um, but uh, spent a lot of time up in northwestern New Mexico in a place called Ghost Ranch, uh, Presbyterian Conference Grounds. Yeah. And uh, learned how to ride horses, drive trucks, round up cattle, castrate bulls, you know, you name it. And I've, I've done it. That's cool. So um, so we share that in common. Ah. <laughs> so I grew up the castrate bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Cronister won't get close to the microphone, but he'll laugh. <laughs> uh, uh, I grew up in southeastern New Mexico. Uh, okay. So I was on a, I, I grew up, uh, half the time I grew up in a small town, Roswell. You've heard of Roswell. Oh, and then, and then. Um, and then I grew up uh, from kind of early teens. The rest of my um, time there was on a ranch between Roswell and Artesia. Have you seen so UFOs? I have seen plenty of UFOs. <laughs> most, most of those were down at the uh, river after a, you know, a couple of beers. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so cool. Well, so um, I mentioned this earlier, and 
and I've seen your daughters several times, and I know that you have nothing to do with this. You don't participate in it. It doesn't create 80 hours of work uh, a week for you. Um, but your daughters have come and, sp and spoken at a couple of uh, events that I've been at and <clears throat> makes me feel uh, it makes me feel great about humanity and makes me feel completely horrible about myself, <laughs> what I've done in life. The you know, you want to talk about changing the world. I mean, some people, you know, we the conscious capitalism movement. Right. So I'm active in that and I love it. And and we talk about recycling or we talk about, you know, whatever we're doing with you know building one house in mexico with some of our profits and things of that nature um and your daughters are changing the world and and it's super cool and so the plug for uh paper for water and isabel catherine and trinity is now pretty active in it how she's old is she she uh, is eight years old okay and uh, will be nine shortly so she's got her fingers moving she rapidly has. and so uh so i would love to have them on the show at some point uh, i think it'd be awesome but uh, so tell me, I mean, they obviously got the entrepreneurial bug big time from from it's in the blood. Yeah. So when they were three and five years old, we were up in D.C. at uh, the Oriental Market up there and they, they saw these wooden cutout dogs that were beautifully painted. And my daughter wanted one and uh, was pretty insistent. And I looked at the price tag. It was 50 bucks and I was going to have to carry it back on a plane with me. And I said, you know, what? we'll, we'll make them at home. Uh, so the following weekend, my wife was uh, out of town that that weekend, and because yeah, of course she'd never let them operate a jigsaw or get as dirty as they were when when they painted them. But they they cut these wooden dogs out of um, plywood, and uh, then they painted them white and put their handprints all over them, and we called them dogs looking for a handout. And they were really actually kind of oh, cute. That's cool, yeah. And they did that. They 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 so loved doing it that the next literally four or five weekends in a row, that's all we did on Saturdays was was paint these silly little dogs. And eventually, my wife pulled me aside and she's like, uh, "Ken, we don't have any more <laughs> wall space for these dogs, so you got to figure out what you're going to do with them." So I had my five year old daughter uh, run up to the local Starbucks. We knew the manager up there, and she had her little cutout dog, and she looked at him really cute and sweet and said, do you have all these other artists in here selling their artwork? Can I sell my artwork in here? And, you know, what's, what's he going to say? Yeah. You know? So <clears throat> he said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll work you a deal. You invite all your friends from your uh, preschool and kindergarten uh, on a Saturday, and I will provide the food. You just get all your friends to buy a drink, and we'll show your artwork. Well, you know, so he took all the food that was going to expire on Sunday right? Uh, and gave it out as free food. And all of her friends ordered drinks. It was his his most successful Saturday ever. <laughs> and uh, the girls sold almost over $800 worth of these dogs. Wow. Uh, and they had so much fun doing it. And, and so they, I said, you know, y you can each keep 10% for yourselves, put in your piggy bank, and then you each take 10% and give it to the church. And uh, the residual, you know, five or six hundred dollars, they uh, took a check down to Children's Medical Center and donated it. The president of the hospital came down. They took pictures of them. I mean, they had so much fun doing that. They said, we got to do a horse show. So they made for the subsequent next, I don't know, two months or so, mm. they made these wooden cut out horses. And the, the art product was so much better than the dogs. They, they decoupaged them. They found horse coins and stamps and they just had these cool things. But the, the problem is they tapped out all their friends' parents on the dog. So right. the next horse show, they, made, they still made about 500 bucks. It was still a good, good showing. So they had this concept of we are, despite the fact we're little kids, we can make stuff that people want. Uh, and so that was when, where my middle daughter, actually, she was, uh, I believe, six at the time, or f four at the time. I taught her how to make these little origami ornaments. And she just took off with it. It took her about a week to make one. It takes her now about a little less than an hour to make one. So it would take about a week. She gave one to the pastor. She gave one to her teacher, church secretary, the librarian. And she ran out of people to give them to. And they started amassing around the house. And once again, my wife stepped in. And she's <laughs> like, you've you got to figure out something to do with these ornaments. We, we don't have enough space anymore. So this time, the middle daughter, Catherine, she went to the Starbucks manager and said, hey, we, we, we're pretty successful. We've done two of these shows already. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do a third one? And this time, he said, I'll give you the whole month. Uh, wow. And so they, um, we had a... Uh, a tenant out in one of our garage apartments who had just been down to Guatemala on a water dig with Living Water International. 
And so she heard the girls were going to do another uh, art show and uh, sell their stuff and that they hadn't picked out a charity yet. Uh, so she tried to convince them to, to uh, get involved in this, in this water charity. And the way she sold it to them was she said, you know, b uh, girls in developing countries don't get to go to school because they're hauling water all day. And that just made the girls pissed. I mean, yeah. they, they were upset because they're like, number one, why, are, why aren't the boys helping out? And, right. and number two, they love school. They, they just enjoyed it. And they're like, that's so unfortunate. You know, the kids don't get to go to school. So they committed to raising $500 towards a $9,200 deep water well in Africa. And after the first night of selling, they'd raised almost $1,000. Wow. And they had the whole month. So they're like, I think we can raise the $9,200. Wow. wow. And From a four-year-old, five-year-old. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and by the, the end of December, they had actually raised $10,000 and had overfunded their first well. Wow. That's unbelievable. How do you teach those lessons? Like, how do you, what do you think is, like, what seeds did you and Deborah fr plant? Yeah, so my, my wife and I have been kind of intentional about this. We, we sat down, and we both have talked so much about uh, our upbringing. Uh, my wife grew up in a trailer home. Her dad had her cleaning out burnt out trailer homes every weekend, and they would resell the, the cleaned out uh, trailer home. Um, and likewise, I just mentioned I grew up really poor, and my earliest memories are being at the Salvation Army with my father, who's a pastor, um, you know, handing out clothes and at soup kitchens, handing out foods. Those are my earliest memories uh, of hanging out with my family. And both of us firmly believe that that is what made us who we are today. And neither of us wants to go back to that. N neither of us wants to go live in a trailer home or in a dirt floor home. So how do we recreate those scenarios for our kids? And that's what we've been trying to be really intentional about. But the problem is, I think in the general public, uh, there's not that opportunity for little kids to volunteer. I mean, Habitat, you have to be 16. And, uh, you know, most of the soup kitchens around here, you have to, I don't know, be 10 or 12 or something like that. So there really wasn't something for uh, little kids to do. And that's why we started thinking about how can we teach them simple business skills. I mean, my favorite story about the girls after their first night of selling ornaments, <clears throat> I brought them home and I sat them down after action review mm -hmm. and, and said, what, what, what went well today? You know, what, 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 what do we need to do differently? And they both looked at me and they're like, well, duh, dad, we're going to make more ornaments. And I said, no, you got to raise your prices. Mm -hmm. And we actually drew a little line graph with a crayon and uh, over the next two months raised prices twice. So we talked about supply and demand. That was at the point where I'm like, here's a four and a five year or six year old that actually are getting supply and demand because they're participating in it. They, they understand it. And so as we moved Paper for Water kind of from just being this one night event to being a two month event, in the back of my mind, it's always been about how do I teach my kids business skills mm -hmm. in a way that they understand and that they can repeat. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of how things have developed. And, and obviously the not-for-profit side of it and how big this has gotten, it's exceeded my wildest dreams. Yeah, I <laughs> unbeknownst to you. I had no <laughs> idea. teaching business skills. Yeah. How many wells have you guys funded now? We, so the girls have raised about $1.7 and have funded over 170 water projects in 17 countries. We just yeah. added our 17th country a couple weeks ago. Yeah. That's the that's part awesome. that makes me feel like crap. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, it's like that you're like, part. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you, you write your check to the church every Sunday and you're like, I'm awesome. And, and, and then you hear this story and go, well, not great at all. <laughs> like I could do so much. We could all do so much more, right? There's so much uh, within us. And I know Aaliyah and I talk about this a lot at the office, just about, um, uh, you know, personal and professional development. And then with the conscious capitalism movement and how much, I mean, you know, change the world, you know, you change it one person at a time, but we all, we all get together and have that same vision and it changes, you know, and, I mean, your, your daughters are just doing awesome work, and I know that uh, that they have a ton of support from you, so I don't, I don't, I, I love putting them on stage, you know, they, w the first time I saw them at the uh, reunion, and, and they talked, and, and I'm sitting there looking at you going, oh gosh, <laughs> I mean, that's not the, that's not the girls just getting up there and doing all their stuff, I know that's a tremendous amount of work and effort, and, um, and what you've given up as well, I mean, we talked, last time we talked to, uh, about how your house is a <laughs> factory uh, just uh tables covered with paper and glue and whatever else the other supplies are that that that's in there 
it's crazy yeah, yeah. Our, our whole house is a warehouse essentially we fortunately we keep our bedrooms relatively free of paper for water stuff but mm-hmm. the entire downstairs is you know two three th- two thousand square feet of just S- paper for water so we, st- we still do need an office space yeah we still do and you know we've we've kind of put it a little bit on hold we have a neiman marcus delivery that happened today um, and that has been uh, a significant uh, push the last couple of months. But you know, my uh, oldest daughter, uh, it was cool. So I don't, I don't think we really talked about. It. We we spent eight months traveling around the world, and right? And every opportunity we had to pop into some small business owner, or talk to them about what they did behind the scenes, we we took that advantage. And and the kids love that kind of stuff. I mean, we visited chocolatiers, we we uh, rose growers, leather makers, etc. So we're we're traveling across Russia, uh, which is massive, six thousand miles on the Trans Siberian Express. A lot of downtime. And <laughs> my oldest daughter <coughs> slides up next to me, and she she says, uh, "You know, Dad, I've I've been thinking about this for a long time, and Paper for Water doesn't have a sustainable business model." And I'm just, I'm just basking in this proud dad moment. You know, yeah. my 13 year old daughter has used those big words correctly. <laughs> Where's the Xbox, Dad? Where's the Xbox? That's that's, that's what 90 percent of the people hear. And and so I'm trying to figure like, how do I continue this conversation and 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 make it meaningful for her? So I'm like, what? Well, what do you want to do? How do you how do you want to fix that? And she's like, well, Dad, I I think we need to start a for profit business where 30 to 50 percent of the proceeds actually go to funding our executive director and and programs and rent and all those kinds of things um and i'm like well that's a that's a great idea what what do you want to do and she says well you know i i think that leather goods have a a ridiculous markup you think about your coach purse it's two thousand bucks that actually costs 30 or 40 bucks to make and uh, obviously there's all that marketing and advertising on the front end of that that makes those such desirable objects but she said you know at, at the end of every school year, I have these uh, backpack, a canvas backpack that I have to throw away. I mean, it's, it's holes in it, it's torn, the zippers don't work anymore. I can't even upcycle it or recycle it. I just have to throw it away. She said, I want to make a backpack like the Japanese kids have that lasts four years. It's beautiful, it's functional, it's made of leather, and, and uh, you know, we'll charge four or $500 for it. We'll get women here in the United States that are. Uh, you know, immigrants or need a, you know, second chance women who are just re- been released from prison or something who need a skill. Uh, we'll have them make it and pay them a living wage and, and just have a great product. And I'm like, wow, you're 13 years old. You've thought this all through. That's, that's insane. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to think of, um, I don't know if it was the, um, the Latin American uh, entrepreneurs or who it was that I met through EO, but there was a, uh, um, heck, it could have been on Shark Tank, I can't remember. But <laughs> 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 I'd like it to be more personal than that, but it might not have been. But they were doing they were doing something, either socks or some kind of backpacks or something like that, where they were ha- they were going to the countries and having you know these in these small villages and having the the mostly the wives because the husbands were out gathering and hunting and doing whatever right. having the wives um produce this and then they were given x amount of it back to the you know they, they were actually part owners of the company or part or profit sharing in the company or something like that so that's really cool well have you met veronica londano she's the ceo for american leather i have yeah, yeah. I, do, I, do, I know veronica yeah well, so we, uh, you know, obviously got got in touch with her, and the girls got to go down and tour her factory. Ama- amazing factory, and just a, a great company. And she knows every single person's name on the floor, man. She, she is does. unbelievable. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, and love that woman. Awesome mentor for the girls. They they just had such a one wonderful time down there. And she she says, you know, actually, what what the Isabel and Catherine are trying to do actually meets a need of hers. Because she said sewing is a dying art in the United States, but leather sewing is a dead art. And she can't find people who have the skill set to, to sew her furniture. So she said, you know, she's going to try to figure out how she can help us s- to create uh, a pool of people that she can um, employ. Because obviously sewing leather backpacks isn't going to take the skill set that sewing leather furniture does, but it's a great training ground. So they work for us for six months and then... Uh, they get hired by American Leather, and if they want to work overtime, they come back and work for 
uh, whatever uh, leather company name actually leather actually for water <laughs> well actually Is isabel has a name for it uh -oh. it's kind of funny because she she says i, I, I want to call the company milmo um, <laughs> i rolled my eyes i'm like okay this better have a good story behind it because that's a goofy name <laughs> and she says well you know i'm always listening to you and your friends talk about how difficult the millennial generation is and how you can't get them to work before 10 o'clock in the morning and they show up on the second day and they already want vacation and and she said, Catherine and I have been working for Paper for Water for seven years now, and we know that it takes hard work. We're up until 1130, 12 o'clock at night, putting in the hours, and it just it takes hard work to do these kinds of things. Things just don't come to you for free. So MILMO stands for Millennials Move Over because Gen Z is here to fix the day. Wow. Oh. And I, I like said, it. I hate her even more now. <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> That is so awesome. You're she so says, good. I think, I, I told her, I was like, I think you'll get investors just off the name. Oh, 100%. <laughs> that's really cool. That is that's really very cool. cool. They're just, I mean, they're just great. It's it's insightful. It's so exciting. I mean, so I knew we were going to talk about your daughters and family, and so that's why I wore my Harry Potter shirt today uh -huh. because we, she loves we, did Harry the, Potter. Uh, we did the Disney um, uh vacation this summer as i roll my eyes um <laughs> and uh and so my eight-year-old uh so i did two things with my kids one my eight-year-old got a harry potter shirt and i decided that i would do the same and so we could be twins and then um and then my daughter um and i went and got a pedicure together and she made me get um dominus blue painted toenails excellent which um i did and got didn't tell that part of the story Steve. <coughs> yeah well i don't come to the office in flip-flops often <laughs> but when i do my toes are shining blue, blue <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um so so uh, i guess and i know that you know i've, I've thought about the the take off a year and, and travel the world and i i know several friends that have done that and just unbelievable experiences one one lady came and said uh, uh well one lady that did it said that that she got into this big argument with another friend of hers because the friend was like, what are you going to do for school? And don't you care about their education? And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and then she goes through, well, let's see, we went to, um, you know, we, we went here and there and we, and we learned science this way and we learned math this way and we, you know, and just, just went through the whole, everything that they learn. And it's, you know, it's 12 years of education and a year journey around the world. Um, so I'm sure that was fun, but tell me, um, uh, aside from that, what do you guys do as a family when you're not folding paper and and uh, and having business discussions with ten year olds? We sleep. Yeah, uh, that's it. That's uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we just spent this last week in New Mexico. Um, you know, hiking, biking, cool. hanging out, horseback riding. Uh, the girls are avid horse women, and uh, they the, the ranch that we go to, they love working at the stables there. Uh, so we, there's a lot of things that we do. We, we spend a lot of time uh, outside doing stuff. Yeah. Um, we unplugged our TV uh, 14 years ago. Wow. Uh, so we don't have a TV in the house. We do have a screen. I, so we do see movies every now and then. Uh, we the, the kids are all device free. Um, much to my oldest daughter's horror. Um, she she oh, over the last couple of months she's gotten a little bit more insistent that she needs something, but that just makes me dig my heels even further in. Um, and uh, it it uh, creates a, a household where we have great conversations and actually talk about meaningful stuff. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It is. So I'm I'm <laughs> a, I'm a huge advocate of that. We have not turned off our TV, and we have a couple of screens and a couple of TVs in the house, but we we try very hard to uh you know i mean this weekend my kids didn't watch any tv at all awesome. um they're outside uh i think that it's so important to engage in dialogue and um you know not that my kids are are you know uh changing the world with paper for water and not to not to embarrass you but but um i think that that when i see our, when i see our children around other children i know that we've done a good job and 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 how important it is. I love the stuff that you're bringing in because Dana and I have been talking about this lately. Of how do we bring in more business as opposed to it's time for me to buy school clothes. I want to buy school clothes or or I need this or I need that. How do we really start bringing in that the value of money and what you have to do to get to it? And and then how do you give back? Right? What's what's important? And I think you know we've done quite a bit of the giving back. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, part of our nightly ritual is talking about what we're going to do tomorrow to help someone else, you know, who's, who's fallen or been made fun of or, you know, whatever. And, and, and how we, um, 
you know, we live as that example. Um, but I think bringing in the true business, um, piece is, is important because truly our jobs are not to be friends and not to be tight and not to be close and not to be cuddly, although all those things are fun, but really our job is to make them successful adults. Right. And, and, for the and real allow world. them to, to move on. Well, Steve, just real quick. Um, I know Uh-oh. Dana was talking about, like... No. <laughs> Don't put me... <laughs> no. I'm the interviewer. Vivian, <laughs> so Vivian, his oldest daughter, actually <clears throat> loves cutting the lawn. Yeah. Like, she loves it. Yeah. Because it's part of her... It's not an allowance. You guys don't call it that. You call it something else, but it's part of how she contributes to the household. Yeah. So you guys have a different way of implementing some really interesting parenting principles that I think are really, like, innovative. Yeah, oh. thankfully for Dana, because yeah. I probably, w- <laughs> probably would have plugged in the TV and said, <laughs> leave me alone when <laughs> But, um, yeah, no, I mean, they, uh, our kids have their chores. Um, they have to read a certain amount. Um, uh, my kids, well, my youngest is getting there, but my two older, my 14 and 10-year-old are both, like, voracious readers. I mean, Lillian, is she's 10, and she's finishing the Harry Potter series for the second time now. She started <laughs> when she was, like, f- five-ish, you know? Awesome. And, um, and Vivian read, Vivian's the strongest reader. She read... Um, uh, she read Dante's Inferno when she was nine. Wow. And she's now reading, um, oh, God, what's the, um, Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, so unabridged or bridged? Unabridged. Oh, that's awesome. 1,400 pages or yeah. something. And wow. she's like, this book's really long. I'm like, what page are you on? 800. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's more than I read in all of college. We, we need to get her and Isabel together because she's yeah. going, she read the abridged version twice and now finished the unabridged version. She did War and Peace while we're traveling across oh, yeah, Russia. Yeah. 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 I, lo- I just, I love, I mean, and it's funny because sometimes I'm like, Vivian, put the book down. <laughs> right. And I, I feel so stupid saying that. It's like, turn off the TV, but it's like, put the book down. Right. We're having a family dinner and we want you to commute, you know, be. But thank God it's that over the other. So exactly. either it's in their genes from their mom or we're doing something right. But it's it's so cool to, to, to just watch the kids grow up and know that we we gave them the basis. If they screw up from here, then it's, you know, it's, it's their, their fault. fault. <laughs> but, but at this point, we're good. So uh, cool. Well, man, I hate to I, I always hate to cut it off because the conversation oh, is so yeah. awesome. But what are we done? It's <laughs> all, see, I told you it's already past time. But. Uh, I'd like to thank Scott Cronister for his input. Just, just <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Absolutely, there we go. Everybody heard his radio voice, um, Dr. Ken Adams. Thank you, thank and you. thanks so much for. And I'll tell them in person when we see him. But um, for everything your daughters are doing, it's it's it. Not only is it helping a lot of people, but man, it's really it really is changing the world. And 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 they set a great example for other kids. And Aaliyah, good to see you. And Mr. Matt Stoker, who I always. Yes. I have to mention at the end because I forget. <laughs> I, I get nervous it. when the guy screams. <laughs> oh, at the at the beginning. Yeah, and so I forget to say. Yeah. But well, again, I mean, we can always remake that if you want to. But we'll figure. If it you out. like the legacy of it, I understand. Thanks so much. You think uh, you think Ken's daughters have done anything worthwhile? <sighs> Gosh, I need to go reevaluate a few things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.